Great. Okay. Very cool. Hola, amigues. Feliz Viernes. Happy Friday. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here with us today. I know it's Friday and many of us are like, oh, I, you know, I want to start my weekend or, you know, live weekend 5,000 in quarantine and come up with new ways to keep ourselves entertained. So why not join us for Octogatos Comp? <laughs> But seriously, it's a pleasure for you all to join us here today. Yesterday was a day full of learning for all of us running Octogatos Conf. As some of you may have noticed, our Twitch streams that are being translated live, yes, being translated live by some amazing translators, we were having some audio issues, but we want to thank each and every single one of you for your patience, for your feedback, and helping us with Octogatos Conf employ a growth mindset. This is how we make things better. So round of applause for you all. And also a huge shout out and thank you to our producer Elaine and to our amazing translators who've been hard at work helping us debug and correct our setup so that we'll have a smoother run today. As always though, please do give us feedback. If there are things we need to correct in the moment, we've got our Twitch chats, we're on social media, uh, we're here to answer your questions. We do have moderators that are going to be watching each of our channels. We have folks that are actually one volunteer in particular, Priya, who's like speaking English, Portuguese, and Spanish, because she's amazing. But we do have moderators in all of our channels who are here to help. So please do reach out to us. If you are, if you are participating with us on social media, we have hashtag OctogatosConf20. And as you do participate with us, just a gentle reminder that we ask everyone to abide by our code of conduct. We love having a great space where all feel welcome. So we just love people to remember to participate by our rules that are stipulated in our code of conduct. That said, we also have a really cool opportunity for people to donate to some of our partner organizations like Tecaria, El Otro Lado, and World Central Kitchen. You can find that information at Octogatos Conf. There's a donate button at the top, and if you click that, there's an opportunity to give. Now, for the start of, of day two of the inaugural Octogatos Conference, we're starting with our Latinx and Tech panel. The theme of today's pa panel, more specifically, is going to look at exploring the role of open source and just broadly the evolution of technology in Latin America. Each of our panelists invited today have a really cool, rich, and unique background that we hope to explore to understand challenges and opportunities they've had in building their careers. As well, we're hoping to explore what some of the themes that our panelists are hopeful for, for the future for Latinx technologists. But first, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Lorena Mesa. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am actually an engineer at GitHub, as well as a member of Octogatos, if you haven't noticed by my shirt. <laughs> Um, I've actually had the privilege to work with some of our panelists before through my work with the Python Software Foundation, as well as my day job with GitHub. As a Latin Xer based in Chicago, Illinois, in Los Estados Unidos, I'm very happy to be here today to chat with our panelists and to learn a lot from them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And just as a gentle reminder to our panelists, please take time to respond slowly and thoughtfully to allow our translators to better be able to translate for us to our other streams. So to kick it off, I'm going to go ahead and ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. So I'm going to actually ask Julian to first introduce themselves, please. Of course. Hello, Lorena. How are you doing? My name is Julian Duque. I am originally from Medellin, Colombia, but I'm currently living in the Tampa Bay area in the United States. I mainly work with JavaScript communities since 2011. I am the organizer of JSConf and NodeConf in Colombia. Also being involved in the Node.js project since 2012, was a official contributor until 2014, but then I moved to like a emeritus uh, contributor. And currently, I work as a lead developer advocate at Salesforce and Heroku, pretty much uh, building up community and working with a lot of different developers. Wow. Okay, so you do like all of the things. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Julian, are your pronouns he, him? 
Yes, he, him, él. Perfecto, gracias. And next, if I could ask Roberta to please introduce yourself. Sure, of course. Thank you, Lorena. Yeah, I am Roberta Arcoverde. I am from Brazil, from the northeast of Brazil, a city called Recife. Um, and I am a principal software developer at Stack Overflow, but I work remote. I work from Brazil, so never left my country. Very proud to, to live here. Don't think about leaving in um, I'm also a podcaster. I have um, a co-host of a podcast every Tuesday here in Brazil about technology and a public speaker as well. I give talks about technology in a bunch of different um, conferences. Um, and I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm working for 15 years as a professional software developer. So it's, it's been a while, Lorena. And my pronouns are she, her, ela. Out of curiosity, what's the name of your podcast? So I can very much go find it. And I speak Spanish, but I can fumble my way through some Portuguese. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, hipsters.tech. Every Tuesday, we talk about all the technologies that are hipstery. I'm very into that. I love that. And next, Felipe. Um, by the way, side note, Felipe loves singing karaoke. Uh, you should definitely ask Felipe on... Uh, social media to talk to you about their love of karaoke because it's amazing. I've witnessed it firsthand. So without further ado, Felipe, would you mind introducing yourself? I would not mind. So as Lorena said, apart from being a karaoke lover, I'm also a software engineer. I have been working for Dotworks for a long time, but right now I'm at an, another company called New Bank. Um, I have received um, awards for my contribution for the Python community, and, and I'm also part of AfroPython, that's a initiative to support black people in IT. Yeah, uh, actually Felipe received this really cool community acknowledgement, something in the Python space, we call a community service award, uh, CSA for short. And it, we like to recognize folks in the Python space who do awesome things. So I'll just say, it's really cool to talk to someone like Felipe and all of these folks here today with their community experience. And I think that's actually a really great segue into our introduction for our last but not least. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra Bourne, and I also work for GitHub. Um, I've worked at GitHub for three and a half years. My pronouns are she and her and ella. And I work as technical project manager, um, working on international expansion. Uh, so that would be internationalization and localization. And I'm super excited to be here and just, you know, talk to you about all things tech. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for your introductions. I think what's really, really exciting is that we've been able to pull people from all different spaces, particularly, I think when people think of, uh, you know, be it we're talking about Latinx, Chicano, <laughs> you know, if some people identify as Hispanic, as we know, many people may identify more with their country of origin or country of residence. As we know, um, Latin America is a large space with many, many amazing communities. It is not a monolith. So in speaking to that a, a little bit, I just wanted to highlight some stats that I think are pretty interesting to help us kind of kick off in thinking about how Latin America is not a monolith. Out of the top 10 countries in the world of folks that spend the most time online, uh, there's actually three that are in Latin America. Um, Brazil, you're, you're at number two. Mexico's at number six. And Argentina's at number seven. And this is according to the We Are Social 2017 global overview. And if you're thinking about in terms of like revenue, um, projected 2021 revenues in the Latin American data services market alone are expected to increase 52% from $2.87 billion in 2015 upwards to 4.37 billion. So one of the things that's really, really exciting about Latin America, and I think um, 
us at Oktogatos are really excited about is not only is it just that we have so much richness in our in our community, but there's just a lot of potential and a lot of growth. So on that note, it, I think it would be interesting if each of you could give me a little bit of an of an overview of how you first got started in technology. Anyone can jump in and, and answer this one first. Go for it, Felipe. Thank you. I forgot a very important thing, my pronouns. My pronouns are he, him, and in Spanish, el, el, and in Portuguese, ele. Um, apart from the question, I have started at technology with, because I thought that a lot of tech companies were pretty cool and that's what bring me the joy to start. But as far as I started to solve some problems and feel very good and see that I could help people through technology, that's what bring me most joy nowadays, be able to help people through my work and the things that I know about technology that I started to think about technology for me. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm afraid my story is pretty boring. I <laughs> started in technology because I went to college for I got a, a bachelor's degree in computer science. And that's actually where I learned to program how to program, which is quite uncommon these days. Um, people are usually starting to program when they're like nine or 11. And I, I did not. I, I actually learned how to program at university and I fell in love with it. I really like the feeling of solving problems that are like abstract ideas and being able to craft something from scratch that would solve that and actually be useful. I love what Felipe said to actually help um, people, right, and create things that can actually be helpful to my communities. But that's how I got started. I was, um, when I was 18, I was like, oh my God, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna study now. And, and Computers seemed to be cool at the time. That was in 2004 or something. So that's uh, that's what I went for. And luckily and gratefully, I it, it worked out. Well, in my case, um, I started off very early. Uh, my father, uh, he used to be like a computer programmer, but he worked with those like big mainframes and old school programming languages. But I must say, I, I got the interest into like computers and technology uh, for him. But it was a very good friend when I was 13 years old that came to my house with a bunch of uh, floppy disks with Turbo Pascal. And he taught me how to like do like a hello world and a basic uh, application with it. Uh, curiously that day my dad came in, uh, saw me like doing like some computer programming, asked me about it. I teach him like pretty much the basic instructions my friend taught me. And that night I came back to my house and my father was still working on the computer. And he told me, okay, I just built an application that solves uh, dif uh, like differential equations of second degree. Let me show you how I, how I did it. And I was like, my dad is old, he is sick and he's able to like write a computer program just with the logic he knew, this is powerful. So that's why I entered this world when I was 13 years old. Um, well, for me, it was actually very different. Um, I was born and raised in Mexico City and I was actually going to university there studying international relations which is very far away from programming. But it was when I moved to the United States in my early twenties, when I realized that I had to reinvent myself. Um, I had moved to basically the Bay Area and living in San Francisco, I quickly realized that all the best jobs were in tech. So at that point I started going to community college and basically taking classes in the evenings after I was done with work and you know, started learning uh, programming, um, technical writing, quality assurance. And you know, that's how I got started and then moved into um, technical project management. Excellent. So I'm actually noticing a few themes that I think would be interesting for us to kind of hark on. Explicitly, I noticed Felipe and 
And I notice also with uh, Julian talking about kind of community and how technology has been able for you to be an agent of change. I'm curious if you wouldn't mind maybe talking to me a little bit more about that, be it if it's something that has just been a philosophy of yours or if it actually has had direct implications for how you do your work as a technologist. Sure, I, I want to reply. Back in the day I started, it was uh, very hard to, to find like good content, like go to internet. Internet wasn't like very developed at the time. Most of the content was in English. We from Latin American countries, we don't have like a very good English education. So it was very, very rough to learn, very rough to, to get that knowledge. So what happened is that we used to get together with other friends. Uh, this was pretty much when I was interested in, in Linux back in 2001. And we created one of those like user groups and we started learning like together, like teaching each other what we, what we were doing, bringing more people into the community. And that created like a place where we can uh, learn together and grow together. And since I learned from a lot of people that uh, spend the time to teach me or to write documentation or articles, I think uh, the best way for, for us that are consuming this type of content and learning this way is to give back the same way, like sharing with others, creating content. And what's the best way of doing that by having a community? It could be like an online community where you can have access to people all around the world or local communities like meetups where you are like pretty much meeting the people that it's local to your area that are sharing the same interest and building those connections. So especially in my case, uh, community has been one of the best ways to grow as a person, professional, and to learn about technology. Um, for me, it was kind of similar, but a little different. When I started to, to get my first internships, I found that it was pretty hard to get knowledge, especially, especially from people around me, so especially at the college or space like this. So that's where I found the tech communities where I could find support. But one thing that I realized when I was close to that community was that most of them was from very similar people and a lot of white, male and cisgender community. And as far as I get close for different people, for example, working with female developers or deaf people and transgender people, I started to realize that be a tech give you a lot of advantage, especially economically. You can get a pretty good salary very fast based on different um, working areas. So I start, I start to realize that apart from be very cool and very satisfying, I realized that people that are not able to get enough money in their life, usually could find the tech care as a social hack to be able to provide for their families and for themselves as well. So this was another point that made me get together with community and get involved with Upper Python and even for support different kind of people in IT. It's pretty interesting, this theme, and actually, Roberta, you, you mentioned this at the top, and I think that's a really important call out about the theme of kind of diaspora, right? The theme of movement. That is a very big theme for Latin America. It's not just the movement of peoples, be it if we're talking about the transatlantic slave thing or talking about internal migrations and just how technology has been able to allow people to stay in their home countries. I was actually curious because you explicitly called out Roberta being proud of being able to stay in Brazil to build this career and to build this work for yourself. So I guess I'm curious, can you comment to me a little bit about maybe some of the challenges you've seen in building a technical career and particularly 
what that challenge may mean if you're not wanting to relocate to say another country or even another a big city, for example, within your country of origin. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I started my career, it was of course harder to find interesting challenging tech problems or great startups or great companies with great salaries that I could work at in my home state, which is why I moved down to the biggest cities in the country, like Sao Paulo. I lived in Rio for eight years. Um, but I believe, I strongly believe that technology is a great empowering actor of change for people who don't want to leave their communities. They don't, like I'm a, like almost every Latino, I'm very close to my family, like very attached to my family. It would be very hard for me to travel abroad and to live in other countries and stay away from them. So I never really wanted or dreamed of that, but I still wanted to work on interesting problems. And I am from a rural, small city area of Northeast Brazil, which is the poorest region of Brazil. So I still had to move, but I still didn't want to leave the country. And now 15 years later, I see that technology actually empowers us all to work wherever we want for whatever company we want from wherever we are. Like, I don't need to move abroad if I don't want to. Of course, if I want to, that's fine. I have a lot of friends who have and who have dreamt of um, making a career elsewhere. But I always wanted to stay here. And it's lovely that technology empowers me to, to be able to do just that so that I can stay close to my family, but also... I can support my local community because I get to make a living here and to be able to, to be close to everybody else, to spend my money here, right? And to make my community grow with my own growth. And I still can find a lot of interesting tech problems and challenges even within Brazil. I, don't, I happen to work for a foreign company, for an American company, so that may sound hypocritical. But I see so many great tech companies and great technology being built, not only in Brazil, but think about Mercado Livre in Argentina, Happy in Colombia. Um, we have Magazine Luisa and New Bank here in Brazil. There are a lot of great companies and startups building amazing technologies in Latin America. So I don't, neither of us, Latin Americans, who don't want to go abroad, we don't have to if we work in tech. There are great problems right here to solve. There are great companies right here to work for, but also being able to work remote also allows us to do that for Japanese companies or American companies or whatever. It's a, it's a great empowering um, career, the one that we chose. Actually, I think that's really interesting, the themes that you're highlighting about how technology, yes, there's obviously challenges, but being able to find opportunity and that increased ability to find opportunity because more companies are willing to work remote. Obviously, though, there's kind of a few ways when we think about meeting people where they're at. And actually, um, Alexandra, Ale, I'm curious if you can talk to me a little bit of some of the work that you've done with uh, GitHub or elsewhere working on product and thinking about accessibility and how we can meet people that are technologists in their home community and what kind of challenges you're working against to help empower people, be it to, be it to solve problems in their home community or just even just accessibility. So I'll pause there because I know you're, you're doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, thank you, Lorena. Well, um, you know, in order for us to uh, be more accessible to others, I think it's very important, uh, the part that translations play into that. Um, there is a lot of people in Latin America that don't speak English or that the English is just very, you know, it's just not good enough to really be able to communicate and makes learning so difficult. Um, just more recently, working on a project um, where we've been translating the documentation for, Git, for GitHub, we've had to, um, I was trying to find terminology that was already translated, you know, for certain terms, trying to be consistent. And just doing searches online, I found that there's just very little documentation, for example, for Git that is translated. So the sources were very, very few. So there's definitely a challenge for people overseas, you know, if they don't speak English. Um, in Mexico specifically, I know that, you know, you go into the bus or the metro everywhere, you know, on the street, there's all kinds of signs for English schools because, you know, it is well known that 
you know, your opportunities will open up as long as, you know, you're able to speak English. Now, looking a little bit now uh, from the point of view of, you know, a person living in the U.S., I do notice as well that there is a need for just generally speaking, people to become more aware that there's a lot of people out there outside of the U.S., and how in order for us to, for example, make our products more accessible, we should try to um, localize them or look into you know, these other markets. Sometimes I fear that many companies are just very uh, US centric and they don't, that they're not capitalizing on the power that it would bring to have their products um, be available and translated into other local languages for people to more easily adopt them. Yeah, I think that theme of localization, obviously with, you know, even the assumption that Spanish and Portuguese are the languages we need to localize in, that does not include the experiences of indigenous communities, which have a very rich language history. And unfortunately, some of these languages we're starting to lose as folks are kind of not encouraged to maintain their history, their legacy, their, their identity. So I think one of the things that's that's been interesting that I've heard some of you hark on has been kind of the, the theme of education empowerment, but also then like how that factors back into open source or maybe not even open source, but like how you can build opportunity yourself to kind of move the needle forward. So I, I'm curious for those of you who have been involved in open source, what role has open source helped what role has open source done for you to help you build your career or for you to help kind of meet some of these challenges and maybe take a challenge and turn it into an opportunity? Sure, I can uh, reply. Since um, I, I mentioned before, I started with, uh, with technology, the main interest I had at the time was like Linux and Linux and like with Linux, you have all these like open source and free software movement. So from like a very, very early age, um, I start to develop that philosophy of sharing, of being able to contribute, to be able to create something that other people can, can use. So initially it was like that, um, intent or desire to start contributing to open source but at the beginning is this huge gap that especially i had and i know a lot of people in latin america have uh, the same issue is that maybe we don't feel uh, confident enough to contribute to an open source project or, or we tend to idealize these core contributors of, of certain projects they have a name they're they are renowned so it was at the beginning kind of like, this is not for me. This is something for the people that really knows about it. And I'm just like a, a consumer of a product or an observant of what is going on. But then when I start like getting involved more in the Node.js community, I see an ecosystem that is welcoming to people like me that wanted to contribute without having maybe too much experience or being involved working on, a, on an open source project uh, like full-time or, or part-time. So finding that community that was open and welcoming and had like a very good like onboarding process make me a little bit more confident to start contributing and promoting and teaching to others how to contribute as well. So it impacted and it, it changes because it started to use open source as a driver for building community around open source. So it was very important for that uh, career development on, on my own. For me, it was a very, very different because I have not been paid to do Python in the last five or six years, but most of the conference that, that I have spoken in the last five or six years, uh, Python conference, or because of, I went to a conference like, the first time that I met Lorena, for example, was in a conference as well. So, and it was a Python conference. 
later she came for Python Brazil last year, and we were we were able to get to know more about each other. And it's not directly related with a working opportunity, but it made me grow a lot. And even a lot of opportunity that I find today are more connected with my open source contributions than usually with my day-to-day -day work. Roberta, considering that you're actually doing outreach in another way, you let off by saying, you know, you're a public speaker and you do a lot of work in creating this podcast. What are some ways that you balance that with your day job? Is that actually something that's promoted? What's your kind of philosophy philosophy with that? Because obviously open source is one way to contribute, but then this, this idea of bringing information to folks where they're at and thinking again about kind of inclusion and meeting people where they're at seems to be some areas that you're really passionate about. So I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I don't balance it, Lorena. I sleep very little. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, it is actually, I think it's it's got to be something that you're passionate about, right? When you invest passion, when there's passion involved, everything gets a little bit easier. For me, creating the, the podcast became easier on, in time. I've been doing this for almost two years now. We do weekly episodes. And it's my favorite way of sharing knowledge and getting actually to learn from a bunch of people as well. We always have guests who are talking about different topics, and I learn a lot from them. Um, public speaking is more challenging for me just because I like to work on my talks a lot. Um, it takes me a lot of time to like wrap up a talk. And it's not something that comes naturally. But all of that is very personally rewarding as well. I think I owe it to people who are getting started because I had the privilege and the opportunity to go to college 15 years ago. And I am from a country where this is not a reality for most people. And tech is actually a career that embraces people who don't have necessarily a college degree as well to a, to a level. So everything that I can do to help those um, people who are beginning or getting started in their careers or everything that I can do to give back. Because again, in Brazil, I went to a public university, so I didn't pay a dime to get my degree. And I think it's a moral duty of mine and of us all to share what we learned and to share what we can with our communities. In our case as well, I love it that I'm able to contribute in my mother tongue in Portuguese, because like uh, Alexander noted, Felipe noted, uh, in, in Latin America, we know that speaking English or understanding English is also not a very prevalent reality. This is uh, also something that only a few privileged people can um, understand. And if I can, and if I have the chance to contribute and to share knowledge in Portuguese so that I can reach out more people, then I will certainly be happy to do so. And actually, Alexandra, from like the product side and thinking about localization, what are some things that you've been hopeful of, be it new ways that people are kind of approaching this kind of work or ways that you find that you are employing strategies to continue to move this work forward? Um, well, the first thing that we're actually working on right now is we're adding translations to the mobile app. So that's going to be available really, really soon. I'll be talking about that in detail in during the Octogatos news segment. So I won't give that away now. Um, but other areas that we're also looking at is of course, machine translation and uh, also possibly community uh, translation. So if some of the people in the audience have any opinions on that, and if you can share them on Twitch, uh, please do. Um, I would just like to understand more about the feeling uh, that, for example, like uh, Spanish people have about those topics. Excellent. So I'm curious, what are some trends that are emerging, be it if it's just in technology in general, or things that you are noticing that are emerging trends in Latin America that are things you're really excited about, be it you're working on it, or maybe you want to get involved in it, and this is your opportunity to shamelessly plug out there that you want to get involved in it. What are some things that you, you all are excited about in the future for technology? Yeah, 
it keeps getting broader and broader and broader and a lot of different options and things to do that it, it gets a little bit overwhelming. What I want personally is not something new, uh, but it's uh, quite exact, uh, exciting, uh, which is uh, distributed systems and distributed computing. This is pretty much what I want to start investing in. But there is another area of technology that I've been uh, reading lately that feels uh, very, very intriguing. And it's uh, biohacking and pretty much genetic manipulation using uh, CRISPR, Cas9, and that type of technologies. So I think is that is being developed ethically pretty well. I think we can achieve a, like a pretty good things for humanity, of course. So that's uh, one of the areas that I think uh, mixing like biology and technology will be like very, very powerful in the future. I am, I for one am very excited about the future of health tech, right? So I, I can't wait for the day. And I'll be able to take a picture of my arm and an x-ray will be sent straight to my doctor without, so that I don't have to leave my home. And also so that we can bring healthcare quality and uh, diagnostics to people wherever they are. So make healthcare remote. That's what I'm looking forward for. I have been thinking about a different topic, something that I have been involved with a little bit, and then it's part of my, why I received the Community Service Award from the Python Software Foundation, is civic tech, where people can contribute to understand better their government, and understand how the money that they pay for their, their government are being paid back. So that's the point that I'm very interested in to get to know and have be able to help people using civic tech. And for me, I would say machine learning and uh, what's happening now in all the advances in machine translation that can help us to make a lot of the information that exists in English right now accessible to people worldwide. I, I think that's fantastic. I think it's really interesting how each of you kind of highlights again that intersectionality of how tech can overlap with something else. And again, knowing that each of us bring our own kind of rich backgrounds to things. I think Roberta, you said it very well earlier where you're like, I might have a more traditional background into becoming a technologist, but you know, there's many paths that lead to the same uh, possible can lead to the same possible uh, destination. And I think that's really, really exciting. So beyond just saying things that you're excited about, is there anything that you would like to plug or share that you're currently working on that you would like to give a call out to, be it if it's here's my podcast or here's an open source project I'm working on or hey, we need help with this thing. That'd be really awesome if you all wouldn't mind doing a, um, a quick share about something you might want some help with. I can go. Um, as part of Afro Python, uh, it's all done for volunteers. And I have been working with other events that are made by volunteers as well. But I, I can see that there are a lot of people that are not being included in tech. So if you can support Afro Python, for example, that has a are willing to bring more black people for IT, males, females, cisgender, transgender, may with some disabilities, and remove the any barrier that you we have in the in between, like language or some accessibility issue. AfroPython is willing to help more people, and if you can support AfroPython. That's uh, a great way to remove as much barriers as we can. Yes, I have something to, to say here. Uh, do the current situation that we are living globally, and now uh, this is evidence that things are changing. Now we are on a remote conference. 
Uh, we at Salesforce and Heroku from the Developer Relations team, we are working on an open source project that is hosted, you guessed, on GitHub. So you can go to github.com slash Fostive, F-O-S-T-I-V-E, which is free and open source tools for incredible virtual events. So we are building a set of tools and widgets and applications that can be used for free for anybody that is organizing this type of uh, live events. So widgets that you can embed to your website, or quiz applications, uh, create like animated GIFs for your events. So welcome contributions, welcome ideas. The idea is like we are, we are all together in this trying to improve what we are going to be doing for, I think, uh, a quite while, like meeting remotely. Excellent. Um, Ale, Roberto, did you all have, any, have anything more you wanted to add, even if people want to find you on social where they can? Absolutely. So yeah, like I mentioned before, listen to hipsters.tech. It's in Portuguese every Tuesday. We talk about technology. Um, myself, Paulo Silveira and Mauricio Linhares, we're the hosts. And other than that, I would just like to say, Lorena, in the beginning, you mentioned that Latin America is a monolith, is not a monolith. And all I could think of, does that mean we are microservices? That's all I had to say. I love that. Ale, any closing thoughts? Uh, well, I just want to invite uh, all of you to uh, sign up for the GitHub Presente Meetup. Uh, this is a new initiative that um, I am organizing, me and uh, Priscilla, uh, that's on the chat right now. If anybody wants to say hello, her handle, I think it's uh, Talk to Pri on the chat. And we're basically organizing these uh, meetups with uh, tech uh, themes, just different speakers. Uh, and it's going to be a monthly event, either in Portuguese or Spanish, it rotates. Uh, so I'm sure somebody can share the link uh, on, on the chat and it's on Meetup. Excellent. I will actually do my part too on social, throw those links up that you all shared, as well as your Twitter handles. They're all on the website, octogatosconf.com, which is how I found all your handles. So you should talk to these fantastic people. The work they're doing is second to none. And I just wanted to say it has been an honor and a privilege to speak with you all. That's my timer to keep me honest. And I think what each of you demonstrate is that service, community, and passion are integral to the Latinx tech space. All of us coming together to do the work we do helps us build a better and more rich experience for us all. So I think each of you are fantastic, and I think I'm going to be following each of you all and trying to be your friend IRL in real life. <laughs> and on that closing note, I do want to say thank you for everyone out there who's watching the tech panel today. Please do hang out with us for the rest of, of day two of Octogato's conference. We will be closing with an, am an amazing DJ set from Christine Gutierrez. It's going to be a fun dance party, so you don't want to miss around this fiesta. So as the infamous Walter Mercado says, mucho, mucho amor and ciao. Thank you again, everyone. Hasta luego. Ciao.